we were pushing hard because I knew that the deadline was going to come up. As far as I remember, I got the frame back on like a Tuesday and we had basically two full weeks to get everything built and ready and then I was allowing myself two days worth of testing to just run the bike up and down and make sure that everything was working because as much as the show that we were going to was a static show, I wanted to make sure that the bike was fully functioning. I started on the front end and we threw the fender onto the front end, got everything together and very quickly I realized that the fork that I had brought in wasn't going to work. We hadn't dry fitted it to the previous setup so in a hurry I had to quickly move everything across back over to the old fork and then got the fender on and because we're running that bazooka shock we can drop the pressure of it and we can change and adjust and see how everything moves and we removed all the air out of it, moved it down and the canister went straight into the fender <laughs> so I phoned Ryan and I was like look man I'm sorry we're gonna cut this fender and I'm gonna have to bring it back to you to be repainted. We Pulled out a, a saw, quickly ran through on a very rough cut to get our clearance. I put it on the belt sander, cleaned it out and everything, dropped it off a back at Ryan and he had to paint it again. And I think by like the Friday he had to fend it back to us again and we could put the fork into the bike and then really start putting everything in place. There's a lot of moving surfaces that need to have a thin amount of clearance and the tolerances have to be a certain paint obviously adds on everything. It's a thickness that goes across the entire thing. So there's a lot of time spent tapping holes, cleaning out paint from clearance holes, getting surfaces prepped back to being the right tolerances. Because normally, if there's something that is specialized or whatever, they tape it off and they block off the holes, etc. so that you don't have a problem. But they didn't know how I built it. So I had to go through and refinish all of that paint prep myself. The remainder of the parts that I needed to get a rolling chassis sorted out was delivered, I think, by the Thursday or the Friday and then that left me with basically a week and a bit to build a completely fresh new wiring harness. So it took me probably three days to build the wiring loom because at that point we hadn't mapped out our wiring harness at all. Get the battery in place, get a battery bracket down and then obviously everything on this bike is also DC fed. So we've got a power supply that runs through from the motor into our regulator, our regulator turns it into DC that immediately goes through to the battery and charges the battery. From there onwards, everything on the bike runs off the battery, which is the standard way that everything else runs, but Vespas normally are AC driven. So it was a complete different setup for the way that the switches, the way that all the standard wiring harnesses, all of the standard hardware that gets used on these bikes is wired differently. So we had this wing made, it was beautiful, Ryan and them did it all in carbon. And when they were painting it up, we thought that we'd keep the carbon finish and just paint the clear coat over the top side of it. And we figured that we would get a similar hue, but because the metal flake was such a bright silver and the carbon is such a dark gray, in the right light, the color would flip and it would be the same. But when it was in the wrong light, it almost looked black. So much to everybody's horror, we <laughs> decided that we were gonna metal flake and paint the wing. This beautiful lightweight carbon fiber wing, we just metal flaked and painted it to match the bike. One of the other things that was a big unknown was the mounting of the wing. I hadn't got a bracket sorted out. I knew that it needed to be able to adjust, but we had no way of knowing where we were going with it. And the one day I just decided, okay, today's wing day, I need to sort this out. And I went and I got some thin plastic sheeting and started just mocking up shapes and hot glued things straight onto the paintwork and whatever just to rough out a shape that I liked and quickly realized that this could be done out of flat panels and maybe one or two wells here and there just to hold it all together but this could all get cut. I wanted it machined, it needed to look like it came out of a CNC. So I phoned up my friend on the Saturday morning for the show <laughs> and I was like look man this is the problem and I've got a huge issue like is there any way you can help me he was super accommodating he was like yeah oh, no problem come through so I mocked up the last panels by about I'd say 12 o'clock on Saturday jumped in the car raced through to him and we were like right these are the panels that we need to cut out plugged everything into CAD drew it all up and all the rest of it modified the parts as we needed and started cutting and ran into issues 
and we ran into more issues and we had problems of tips breaking and clogging up with aluminium and this aluminium sheeting was just so soft the machine is meant to run dry it doesn't run with the coolant and it was just blocking up all of the teeth and we would be running we'd get like halfway through the cutter and it would be beautiful and then the aluminium would start heating up and it would just stick to the teeth of the cutter and the cutter would bounce around and it would ruin the parts and we were running out of raw material and it was now two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning and his neighbors were jumping up and down because we were making a noise and uh, we decided okay, okay let's just gather our thoughts we'll come back tomorrow we'll try again came back the next day and I brought some coolant with and we decided to manually add coolant this is a little bit of lubricating oil and that seemed to do the trick it was a hell of a lot messier but that was what basically fixed it and we could finally get the cuts done get the parts cut out and I think around four o'clock in the afternoon on the Sunday we finally got all of our parts finished and I tacked everything together very early on Monday morning and by about seven o'clock Monday morning I had the wing bracket together and mounted and um, that was a big relief because that was something I had no idea what was going to happen and we managed to come together and get it done in a day and a half and it's one of the features that everybody likes on the bike it's something that a lot of people have reacted to positively as much as the wing speaks volumes about what you're doing when you look underneath it and you see that mounting it looks like it was built for it it's, it's high quality fits and that was what i wanted um, i do want to anodize it but we just ran out of time so now that the show is over and everything there's a lot of things that i'd like to touch up and whatever so that's one of the things that will be sent in for anodizing just to get a nice coating on it for the future so the timeline was a huge thing. Sometimes you gotta just sort of compose yourself and be like, okay, there's time, we just need to take our time, work things out, map it out properly. We had issues with a few parts that we had brought in and they got stuck at customs. So we had this sort of time crunch that we needed these parts and they just kept delaying and kept delaying and kept holding it and kept holding it. And there was some sort of small error that an oversight that somebody had made somewhere along the line and the, the order was just being held. I eventually drove all the way through to the other side of Joburg and went and fetched the parts myself because I needed the boxes. After those parts, I basically had three working days and a weekend. At that point, it was, there was very little sleep. Yeah. We had been working from sort of three o'clock in the morning every morning till eight, nine o'clock at night every night. The other thing that turned out to be a challenge was the fuel system. So I had a tank set aside for it that I was pretty happy with. It had a large volume of fuel in it and everything and it had a, a nice tap in it already that would flow well. The Tuesday before the show, I got the first ride in. The bike was just starving. Like, I'd get halfway through first gear and it was starving and I very quickly realized that the pump wasn't big enough for me. So we changed everything out, put a bigger vacuum pump on, ran bigger lines and all that sort of stuff, and I thought, like, well, then we should be there. I haven't done huge speeds on it yet, but I've gotten it up to third gear at like 130 odd k's an hour, and it's still lifting the nose, but then I can feel it starting to lean out. So we need to still the large from the fuel pump. I think it's probably gonna land up being an electric pump. That way I can at least control the flow and all that sort of stuff and then I'll just run a bypass line back to the tank but that's something that still needs to be figured out. The wheelie bar was mocked up after our test runs. Our test runs were the reason why we built the wheelie bar in the first place because it showed us that the bike was just unrideable. But the wheelie bar was untested. So on the Tuesday before the show when we were started it and took it for its first run that was the first time we could see how the wheelie bar worked and let me tell you it is perfect. It's as though somebody's standing behind you and they just like gently push you back down again. It does drag a little bit on uneven ground. Um, so you can set it up a little bit higher to get away from that, but then you also have a little bit higher nose, nose height when it's on the back wheel. But it's so soft, it's so gentle, it's not a hard whack. When it comes up onto the wheelie bar, it doesn't throw you around or push you to the one side or anything over the moon with the way that that works on the bike in practice and it's definitely needed first gear second gear and third gear you're on the wheelie bar the whole time <laughs> there was a lot of vision that went into this bike that nobody supported <laughs>
there were a lot of people that wanted something else. And when we started with this idea and we started bringing Turbo into the BFA board, like the two are completely separate. Even though they had to merge, we have this really fast BFA Vespa that we're building. And then we have this idea of Turbo in a Vespa. And the fact that we threw them both in at the same time and actually landed up with something that presents the way that we wanted to is a miracle. The big feature on Turbo that either some people absolutely love it, some people absolutely hate it, is the eyes. We felt the eyes were absolutely necessary. We had airbrushed mirrors that were done beautifully, but were in the standard shape of the mirror and it just wasn't enough. Everybody came together to make that vision a reality. We only got the eyes on the bike the day before we were leaving for the show. That, that process alone was a three week story for the body guys. There was a lot involved with that. It was a 3D printed cup that gave the general shape on the backside of the mirror that was then taken and used with, with clay, molded around a GTS mirror to get the stem thickness and everything. Then a mold was pulled off of that and done in fiberglass. And at the end of the day, we've now gotten something that has a little panel at the backside with a keying feature at the back with a single grub screw at the bottom. And basically you loosen that one scrub screw, the panel pulls out and the whole cover can come loose out with the mirror in the middle. When those eyes are on the bike, they're completely rigid. The mirrors still have adjustment within them. So you can still set them up the same as you normally would, but the eyes are bolted down onto the brackets as a fixed feature. It gives Turbo a personality as opposed to it being just a bike. And hilariously, because they're on the handlebar and they move, you get this awesome dynamic that we had never even thought of where the bike will be parked somewhere and it will be like the bloody thing is like gazing off into the distance looking at something hilariously like it's got so many different facial features that come out that are that are brought to life because of those eyes on that handlebar the motorcycle appreciation show is a show that we get invited to every year and it's it's quite an honor to be there it's for custom bike builders only now this is people that appreciate motorcycles but not necessarily scooters. We have been lucky enough to be invited to every single one so far. People are coming to see custom choppers, they're coming to see custom bobbers and cafe races and high-end really fancy motorcycles. And they get there and there's the stand with Vespers and it catches a lot of people off guard. Some people aren't interested in it at all. Other people are completely blown away and gobsmacked that this exists. And then to have Turbo standing there on top of that it was just hilarious to see people come into the hall and expecting to be seeing really fancy bikes looking all serious and looking at what's happening and whatever. And then they turn around and they see this like animated snail Vespa and everybody just bursts into laughter. It's, it was amazing. Everybody had a lot of fun looking at the bike. The other thing that we were loving and we, we, were, we sort of expected it to a degree but it exceeded our expectations by every manner is the amount of love that that bike received from the kids. And they're all wanting to have pictures taken with it and everything and it was like an icon for them. As they went through the whole show and they were coming out, everybody was coming straight back to the Vespa again to have more pictures taken. Um, so for me that was, that was something that's really cool. I wanted to speak to the kids directly and I wanted to get to everybody's inner child. So far in my career this has probably been the most incredible thing I've ever managed to build. It's come together really well. But a large part of that has to do with the people that were involved and what everybody's put into this. Ryan and the team at Custom Creations have put their hearts and soul into this bike. So a huge thank you to them for what they've managed to do for us. And then all of the little contributions that we've received from people from all over the place has been massive to each and every person that's managed to give something to the way that this bike build has come together. A huge, huge thank you. And then of course, thanks to Warp Studios for showing this to the world. I hope that there's going to be a lot more builds and there's going to be a lot more projects and we can showcase to everybody what we're capable of and what happens in this little country at the bottom of Africa. So the biggest thank you is to my family and to my dad specifically because without him, we wouldn't be able to do this. He let me run with the vision that I had even when I think sometimes he didn't see it and and I think at the end of the day we've come out to something that's that we can all be really proud of.
we have a new deadline um, dates to be released soon where we are taking this bike and we're going to run it down a drag strip and we're going to run it up against a couple of more well-known motorcycles to see how it compares. We still don't know what effects the wider side panels, the wing, wheelie bar, all of those things are going to have at high speeds. So that is all a big question mark still and the next time that you see the bike will basically be on the drag strip.